Welcome to a walk in the garden. It's a great day in late May and things have really popped out. It's time now to start planting some of the more tender things. Since we visited the herb garden two weeks ago, a number of things have come up and I've planted a few new items. One that's new to me is the Rumex that's down here and I've planted some extra thyme different types of thyme. Some of them are less hardy, some are more hardy. I've also planted a rue, which I lost over the winter this year, and a little basil, so that we'll have a little early basil. Today I'm going to plant one of the scented geraniums. This one is a rose geranium, and I took cuttings last fall. It won't stay over the winter, in this climate, but you can take cuttings and save them inside if you have a bright room. And I'm going to plant that today. I also put some compost on this garden. Get down here and tip it out of the pot. Notice we have some nice roots in there. And firm the soil around it. I have other geraniums to be planted, and I also will be planting lemon thyme and lemon balm. They're very tender herbs, so I want to make sure the temperature's above 50 at night before I put those in. That's true of most of the tender herbs and vegetables. You want to make sure your temperatures are staying pretty much above 50 most nights. Otherwise, you risk damage to them, or at least they will not continue growing well. We'll water this in, and it will expand over the season. There are many things in the herb garden we can start to pick. Uh, we have mint that's up enough that we can take a few sprigs for our tea, lemon balm, lime balm, uh, chives, of course, are starting to blossom. They'll add a little color to the garden. I have several old-fashioned roses, and they have a wonderful aroma, the aroma of old roses. Also in the herb garden, I have a rhubarb plant. This came from one of my husband's relatives' farms, and we can start picking rhubarb now. And to pick rhubarb, you just pull on a shoot until it comes out of the ground. That's all there is to it. There's no need to cut it. In fact, you want to just pull it. And uh, you can harvest that. We'll be using some of that later in the show when I do the segment on what we can cook with the things we pick. Again, tansy is out. That is not a culinary herb, as is the rue, uh, not a culinary herb. We also have some chamomile that I put in, a small one. It can be used for hair rinses and other things like that. So not all my herbs are, are able to be used in the kitchen. Some of them have other uses. The tansy and the southern wood and the rue all can uh, keep insects away and also mice. Don't like the scent of those particular herbs. Let's move on to the perennial garden. A lot of the perennials are starting to bloom. Many of them are just almost in bloom. By the next time we meet, they will, should be in full bloom, and we can see what they look like. Things will be a lot more colorful out here. We do have azaleas in bloom, and rhododendrons are starting to come into bloom as well. There will be more uh, rhododendrons in bloom in another week or so. Columbine is in bloom, and this is uh, one of the pink ones. There are many different shades of colors in the columbine. Probably we'll have a close-up later. Some of the late tulips are just finishing up. These will be cut off later. 
In the middle of the tulips, I have some aliums, which will be blooming shortly. They're in full bud right now. Uh, iris is also almost ready to bloom. The bearded, the tall bearded iris. A Veronica will be blooming soon, as will the poppies. The poppies have set their buds, and they'll be in bloom in a couple weeks as will the Siberian iris. The Siberian iris follows the German iris, which is the tall iris that is most familiar. I do have miniature iris, and we'll get some pictures of that a little later. I have common daisies, which will bloom now, and Siberian daisies, which will bloom. I'm sorry, not Siberian daisies. <laughs> I have common daisies, which are going to bloom very shortly, and I also have Shasta daisies, which are a later blooming summer plant, but have the same daisy shape. When you plant a perennial garden, you want to vary the shapes of your plants a little bit, so that you have some tall spiky things and some round things. It makes a more interesting garden if you have some varied shapes and even some varied colors in the foliage. Perennials bloom once during the season. Some will rebloom a second time later, but you can count mainly on one flush of bloom, so you want to make sure you have some interesting foliage in there, too. The rose that I cut way back has started to come, and it looks like it may bloom. And the clematis is setting buds. Again, in a couple weeks, it will be in full bloom. Now to do some of the chores for the perennial garden today. This is a chrysanthemum. Earlier I said, if you want your chrysanthemums to come back, you need to plant them in the spring. This one has been here probably about four years, and the time has come to start pinching it. If you want your chrysanthemums to be bushy and have all those blooms that you see with the florist chrysanthemums and the ones that will be available in the fall, pinch them back about a, oh, maybe a half, quarter to half inch, right in the spot where they're starting to grow in the middle of each shoot. Just pinch it back a little bit. What happens when you pinch it back, and you can possibly see it right here, is that it will form two different shoots at that point. This keeps it shorter, for one thing, and it will add to your blooming area when it blooms in the fall. So just pinch it back a little bit. You're going to repeat this until about July 4th. After that, no pinching. That's when it will set its buds for its fall bloom. But this will keep them from getting tall and leggy, at least as, quite as much. This happens when you keep chrysanthemums from year to year. If you don't do the pinching, they just get tall and floppy. We're going to move over here. The other thing, besides pinching chrysanthemums, phlox tends to get a lot of uh, mildew. And to help avoid that, what we want to do is thin the phlox a bit. And what I'll do is take my clippers and just go down to the base of the plant. And we want to keep a nice shape to it, but we want to cut out some of the shoots. This gives the plant a little more air circulation. You'll still get the flowers, but you may not get the mildew as badly. I'm also going to be using a product called Serenade this year, which is a mildew preventer. Uh, I'm going to see how that works. Other things that you can use would be uh, a combination of a little baking soda and dish soap, just the regular hand dish soap. Uh, combined with water as a spray. That will prevent mildew as well. But we, we just want to take out some of the heavy growth, and this will give it a chance to get some air in there to circulate. When it's hot and humid is when the mildew tends to be a problem. Some roses or some flocks and roses too for that matter are more or less susceptible to mildew. 
Uh, white phlox called David is less susceptible. I have a blue phlox called Blue Paradise, and that one is also less susceptible to mildew. If you can buy varieties that are less susceptible, you'll have fewer problems with it. Also, being in full sun helps a lot. The other plant that benefits from this is the fall blooming aster. And there's one here, it, it will be up this tall come fall, but you can see it's very thick. And I want to go in there and take out some of it to thin it out so that we don't have as many shoots. And this too will help with mildew on this plant. I have both pink and blue. This happens to be one called Purple Dome. And it's a very nice plant, but if it gets too crowded, it is susceptible to mildew. You don't always have to spray things to prevent problems. Sometimes just some uh, prudent clipping and thinning will help. We'll take a few more shoots out later. These are English bluebells. They are a late blooming bulb and uh, they're quite dependable and they grow in both the sun and the shade, which is rather nice. They tend to do a little better in the sun if it's a cool season. These are regular peonies and this one will bloom later. If you have peonies and you would like extra large blooms, you'll notice that each peony has some side buds. And if you pinch out the side buds now, your main bloom will be larger. I tend to leave them and just have them bloom as well and have side buds, but uh, if you want the large central peony, pinch out the side blooms. Another thing that you want to do right now is check lilies. If you have lilies, lilies are really quite beautiful in the New England gardens. At least they were until about five or ten years ago. An imported pest called the lily beetle descended upon us. It's a red beetle that you'll find on the lilies. And it's bright red, bright vermilion red. You can hardly miss it if you're looking for it. You can miss it easily if you're not. The lily beetle will put a few holes in your lily foliage. Nothing real serious, and you may be tempted to ignore it. However, it will lay eggs, and then the larva of the lily beetle will consume your lily entirely. So the time to get it is now. When you see that lily beetle, pick it off and uh, destroy it. The other thing you can look for if you found the adult beetle is under the leaves there will be egg cases. I've been watching these fairly closely. There will be little rows of yellow eggs and you can just rub them with a gloved finger and that will get rid of them. If you've let the beetle lay eggs and the larva emerge, they're rather nasty to pick off, but if you don't pick them off, you'll lose the lilies. They will completely defoliate them and then they will die. So it's worth checking any lilies that you might have and taking care of the lily beetle now. There are some insecticides you can use. Unfortunately, those are the ones with imiclodopid in them, and they are very, very toxic to bees. Uh, they're neonicotinamids, and they are banned in some countries and discouraged from use in any organic gardening because they are so toxic. So the best thing to do is to pick them off. They have in Rhode Island, I think it may perhaps University of Rhode Island, they have released a parasitic wasp that attacks the lily beetles. 
and I've seen improvement over the last two years. I'm not sure if it's because I've been squashing them as fast as I can or if that parasitic wasp has come into this area. The problem with some of these imported pests is they have no natural enemies and therefore they just proliferate. Uh, many people stopped growing lilies in New England because of this pest, but it is possible to grow them if you're diligent. Now it's time to move on to the vegetable garden. That's where the action is during this season. Okay, many of the things in our vegetable garden are, garden are coming up. A lot of the lettuce, arugula, some of the flowers, beets. Some of the things that are up you can't quite see because they're still very small. But we're, now it's time to plant some of the tender vegetables. And today I'm going to plant First of all, some eggplant, and I'm going to use this uh, row that we put in a couple weeks ago. We put it in to warm the soil because eggplant really likes it warm. And I've cut holes in it with scissors. I cut an X, and then I use that X's in order to dig, dig my hole to plant my plant. I'll just plant one at this point. I'm going to add in the bottom of the hole, mixed with the soil, some tomato fertilizer. Actually, it's for tomatoes, eggplant, and peppers. And I'll use it when I plant each of these things. And I'm just going to mix it well in the bottom of the hole with the dirt that's down there. This is fairly high in phosphorus, otherwise it's balanced with nitrogen and potassium. NPK is the what they have on it, and the N is nitrogen, the P is phosphorus, and the K is potassium. And you'll see that on in each bag of fertilizer. So we'll put that in at the same level at which it grew in the package. And we can proceed to the next one. We'll plant another one too. And we'll just go along until we've planted all six. The rest of the row, I will plant peppers. And then we'll do that around Memorial Day. The lilacs are in bloom right now. And that's one indication of it being time to plant these tender things. Another one that uh, is kind of an old saying is that you plant these things on Memorial Day. Now you have to remember that Memorial Day used to be always on the 31st of May, so you don't have to rush too much. Um, this year Memorial Day is a little earlier than that. If you get the things in too early and the soil hasn't warmed up, they won't grow anyway. Or not as quickly, it can set them back. Again, we pinch them at the bottom to get them out so that we don't break their tender little stems. As things come up, I'm going to start mulching with straw and we'll mulch around here. We'll leave this black plastic in as the mulch for these vegetables. The black plastic will continue to hold the heat, and eggplant really like it warm. So we'll continue with those, and we'll give them a drink. And maybe even come back tonight and give them another drink, especially if rain is not in the forecast. Anything that you plant, watch for a few days, and be sure to keep it watered if there isn't rain or at least cloudiness in the forecast, and especially if the temperatures get really hot. Now I'm going to move down and plant a tomato. I have things set up. You'll remember I put in this black plastic, or black and red plastic, mostly the red plastic, a few weeks ago. I will try to avoid stepping on my strawberries.
We'll dig a nice hole for this one. And again, we'll use some of this uh, tomato fertilizer in the bottom of the hole and mix it with the soil that's there. This one's been grown in a peat pot. So what I'm gonna do is just pull the edges off the top of the peat pot. If you leave the edges outside of where you bury it, uh, there's a possibility that that peat will dry out and then it will wick moisture out from the soil. You wanna keep the moisture with the plant. Now on, on tomatoes, I want to bury them deeply. Peppers and eggplant, you plant at the same level that they were in the pot. In fact, that's true of most things. Tomatoes, however, are going to put out roots all along the stem. So we want to really get the tomato down deeper. In fact, you can even set it on its side and fill it up with soil around it. You'll remember I made the little uh, labels and put the name of the tomato on it. I use just numbers and then I have a master list that tells me what that number is. This one is an Amish paste tomato. We'll continue the same way throughout as we plant the rest of the tomatoes. You'll notice I've used both a cage and a stake. I tried using cages and uh, they tend to fall over if the tomato gets too heavy. I put in stakes and then I can tie the tomato to the stake as it grows, but the uh, cage kind of keeps it within bounds. And they kind of work together. I may even put in a second stake on some of them if they get too large and heavy. Next we're gonna plant some seeds, some of the more tender seeds. Come over here, and I'm going to first plant some cucumbers. You'll notice I've put up a support for my cucumbers so that they can climb. Otherwise, they'd be all over the garden. And I haven't put the strings on it yet. I usually wait until they come up a little bit, and then I'll tie string around the bottom and loop it up to the top so that I have a nice structure for them to climb. Make a cucumber teepee. These, I'm just going to space the cucumbers around the bottom of this teepee. Oh, maybe three or four inches apart. This is a variety called General Lee, which I've had pretty good luck with. And then we'll smooth the soil over them. Pat it down pretty good. And it won't be long before we see them start to come up. At that point, I'll put up my strings so that they can climb when they're ready. We'll do the same thing with the other two sides of the triangle. The next thing we'll plant are some beans. I've dug a fairly deep furrow for the beans, and I have both green beans and yellow beans to plant. I'm going to start with the green beans. I'll plant more of those because we really like them. Again, I want to use the uh, legume inoculant. And this helps with garden peas, sweet peas, beans, lima beans, and soybeans. So we'll dust a, put a little of this dark dust in and just shake it into the bag of seeds. And it should stick to them fairly well. We wet the peas a little bit, but you really don't have to do that with the beans. Just so they have a little on them. Then I'm going to plant the beans. 
couple inches apart. a few more feet of beans. And I'll put a little rock at the end so I know where I stopped with these. And again, cover them up. Bean seeds are larger, and if you use the guide of about three times their size, cover them with maybe a half inch to three quarter inch of soil and then smooth that down. Beans are one of the easiest vegetables to grow. They, they really are quite easy. They don't have too many pests and uh, they make a nice harvest. You can harvest them for a very long time. I'll do the rest of the row with the yellow beans a little later. No need to water these in right now. Hopefully we'll get a little rain that'll start them growing. But the soil is damp underneath from rain we had earlier in the week. I can also plant flowers now, zinnias, marigolds, any of the annual flowers. And I'll be using the other side of my garden to plant these things. I put in some celery plants a week ago and they're growing. Celery from the garden is very good. It bears little resemblance to the celery you get at the grocery store. We always enjoy having a little bit. I put in just six plants. The next thing I want to plant is some squash. For my squash, I've set aside an area, not in rows. Uh, I'll start my rows beyond the squash. Try to grow squash, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. All of these things you need to try to rotate around the garden. It gets a little difficult sometimes to do that, to find the space, but it's important to try to plant them in a different spot each year. This helps discourage any types of pests that you had last year. They may not find the new spot quite as fast. And any of the uh, eggs of the insects that are still in the ground would be in the old spot instead of the new. So it can help with your uh, disease and pest protection. I've made hills for my squash. Again, this is going to help warm the soil. They like it really hot. I'm planting some bush squashes. They come in bushy, bush and vining types. And these are called eight ball zucchini. They're a round zucchini that we have found to be very good. And what I'm going to do is just poke in about five in each hill. and then just pat them in and wait for them to come up. Same over here. I'm going to do three hills of zucchini. How much zucchini can you eat, you know? If you plant one hill, it's sure to fail. If you plant six, they'll all grow. Seems to be the way it works. I don't want to have to resort to leaving zucchini on people's doorsteps.
Again, these seeds are fairly large, so you can cover them about a, about a half inch. Now we'll do some yellow squash. This is a, a gentry yellow crookneck. Oops, we spilled the seeds. Always good. Be sure to mark where you've planted things on your garden plan as you put in the rows and you'll know what's coming up. Or what to expect to come up so you won't pull it out as a weed. By around Memorial Day, my garden will be pretty much completely planted with seeds and plants. Uh, we can put, do some later plantings later in the seasons as some of these things mature. I've put in already turnips, carrots, more beets of a different type, and pirinsacaba, which is a vegetable that's new to me. It's a broccoli type vegetable that is for cutting and stir frying. So it'll be interesting to see how that one comes out. I also planted a perennial type spinach. It isn't actually a perennial, but it will last much longer than the other spinach we put in, which is a spring crop. It's an, uh, you can cut it throughout the summer. It will actually replace that spinach as that spinach goes to seed. Now we're ready to move on. This is a tree peony. It's different from the herbaceous peony that dies back every winter and then comes up and blooms in the spring. I showed you some of those. Those are the ones we took the side buds off of. This is a tree peony and it, it maintains the structure throughout the year and it blooms in the spring before the herbaceous peonies bloom. I think they're quite beautiful myself. They're a Japanese tree peony. They have bred these with the other peony peonies to make an Itoa peony, and I don't have one of those. They're still quite expensive. I would like to get one someday and probably will. But the tree peonies have a short bloom time, but when they do bloom, they're really fantastic. You can cut a whole bloom and put it in a bowl and have a centerpiece. They're really fantastic. And they're easy to grow, and they're hardy in the winter. What more could you ask? I have not had any pests on them. This is a mugo pine, and it is susceptible to the pine sawfly. And a, the pine sawfly larvae are little black caterpillars, and they have red eyes, and they're tiny at the beginning, but then they expand. They can take down a whole pine in a couple of days. So you want to watch, if you have mugo pines, you want to be on the lookout for these things and get them while they're small before they uh, totally eat your pine. Any spray with spinosad in it will work on them quite well. Uh, there may be other things you can use, but I know that one works very nicely. And you need to have it and get it on there right away, or you can lose whole sections of your bush very quickly. I found them on it about three days ago, so it would be about mid-May that they start to come out. And you'll just notice at first that there's blackening along the edge of a stem. And then when you get close, you realize it's all these little tiny caterpillars, very ugly little caterpillars, actually. And you do need to get rid of them because they have a huge appetite. And they'll just go right through the pine very quickly. Now let's put together a hanging planter for the patio. I'm going to make a hanging basket for my patio. and. I have a basket and it has a liner in it uh, that has been used before, but you can use it again. In the bottom of the planter, I'm going to put a pan. This happens to be an aluminum pie pan, and uh, you can use a cake pan, but an aluminum pie pan or cake pan works really well. This keeps water from just running right through the, the plant when you water it. It will hold on to some of the water and keep it there. This is going to be a full sun planter, so we want to make sure we can keep it watered. 
I'm also going to add some Osmocote, which is a slow release plant food, and I'll add that into my potting soil. And I've added some vermiculite to that potting soil too. The plants are going to be heavy enough, so I want to have a light plant mixture. And I'll just put a little of that in now. And then we'll start putting the plants in. I put a geranium in the center. Pull my tags. And we have some diamond frost. This is going to be fairly full, which is just what I want. I also have a begonia. This is a purple one. These are pretty wet. They're fitting together pretty well. There'll be some space in between. A couple of calbracoa. It's going to be, as you can see, a pink and white and purple. But we need a little more under this geranium. Kind of push the soil around as you go. We want something that hangs down, and this is a sweet potato vine. Put that in. And this one is a Tradescantia purple one which is uh, not hardy. I took cuttings of these to put in my planters. And it too will hang down and it has little blue flowers on it eventually. If I have any space left, I'll put in a couple of verbena. That too will grow and bush out on the sides. here. Oh, it's already looking pretty good. We can hang that up and we need to fill in around it with soil. And just push it down between the plants. Right down in there. I may add a little sphagnum moss around the edges of this. Uh, it doesn't quite come up, the liner doesn't quite come up to the top, so I might want a little bit of moss around the top. But the plants will soon cover it, so it's an optional thing. Got it pretty well filled and a little more right there. Push everything together. I have chains and I'll hook these together with a hanger and hang it uh, ultimately. But the first thing I'm going to do is give it a good drink 
And to do that, I'm going to put it into water. And I have a trug with water in it, and I'm just going to suspend it in there and leave it there probably overnight, and then hang it up in the morning. You can do this any time all summer that you want to really give it a deep, good drink. This will wet it very well because it will soak right in. And then we'll hang it, and uh, I will water it just with a watering can regularly, and I will start feeding it in another couple months. The food we put in the soil should feed it until then. But if it really gets hot and dry, and or it dries out because you went away on vacation, you may want to give it a good soak again by filling something with water and just letting it soak overnight. It usually will revive a hanging planter pretty well. Even if you buy one and find it's drying out, just give it a good soak and it should be fine. Now let's go back to the shade garden. Shade gardens can be really nice. Uh, they're a nice place to work in the summer because it's cool down here instead of being out in the sun. A few plants I want to point out. Uh, the hostas, of course, have expanded exponentially since we were last here. And one of the things you can do to make hosta really thrive is to use the tomato fertilizer on the hosta. I read that in a hosta book somewhere, and I've tried it, and it seems to work really well. So find a nice tomato fertilizer and just put a little around each hosta plant. This is the hellebore that bloomed so nicely a month ago, but now the blooms are finished. It's going to go to seed and we'll have plenty of seedlings to move around the garden. The other things that are in bloom are lily of the valley and our ferns are starting to come up. They really add to the shape of the garden. Again, look for shapes in a shade garden because you don't have a whole lot of color most of the time. But you do have shapes, so you want something that's a little lacy, something that's more bold, and of course ferns add a vertical element and a little interest, and sometimes different shadings of color. This little plant is sweet woodruff, and it's actually an herb, but it makes a wonderful ground cover. It'll grow in sun or shade. It uh, really does well in this climate. It has a nice little white bloom right now, but then it just calms down and does a nice job. You can pick it, and we're going to use that. You use it for May wine, it's a, which is a German tradition, and they have it on May Day, or did. I don't know if they still do or not, but uh, May wine is a, a German thing, and we're going to make my version of May wine in a few minutes. Trilliums are also in bloom. These are wildflowers. And my shade garden is a combination of wild things and things I've planted. In this particular area, most of these things have been planted. If you like wildflowers, please don't harvest them from the wild. They need to stay in the wild. But you can get them at Garden in the Woods in Framingham because they propagate the wildflowers there. It's the home of the New England Wildflower Society, and they do propagate the wildflowers, and you can purchase various ones if you want to add them to your garden. You need to try to mimic the spots where they grow and they have a lovely tour that you can take and see where the wildflowers do grow and what conditions they like. Another plant that's in bloom right now is called Tiarella. That's one I've planted. There are two types of Tiarella. There's the bush form of which this is one example. There is also one that's called running Tiarella and that one will spread over a large area as in a ground cover. So if you don't want something that spreads, be sure you get the one that's a bush instead of something that spreads. Again, more ferns and more hosta. Uh, keep it up with the deer spray and the slug treatment, slug o or whatever you wish to use. I avoid the ones with the poisonous chemicals in them and use the one with the iron phosphate which breaks down into the soil. And so far, it seems to work most of the time. This one has been damaged. I'm not sure if it was a slug or just the fast expansion of its leaves. Some of the larger hostas, when we get warm weather and some rain, will expand so fast that the leaves split or they drawstring. Uh, it does happen. The epimediums 
have grown. We had our little delicate blooms about a month ago. Now we have just some lovely foliage that will last all summer. This is my cool, calm spot in the garden where I like to come and relax, maybe bring a book. The pond is up and running. Uh, I have nine fish, which is, they have been here for eight or nine years. They will stay all winter if you keep a hole in the ice for them with a little heater. And they're getting a little large. Nine is quite enough for a pond this size. I also have aeration units, that's what makes the bubbles. It adds a little oxygen, which the fish need. I have a waterfall. I also have a skimmer. If you build a pond yourself, you learn a lot in the process. One thing I learned is I probably should have put it in more sun because I can't grow too many plants in the pond. I will be putting some in. I've already put a few in, but I'm limited on the number I can grow. Water lilies will not necessarily bloom here because they just don't get enough sun. They need a full day of sun. So if you want water lilies, put your pond in the sun. However, I don't have too bad an algae problem because it is shady. You'll have more algae in the sun. So take your choice, algae or water lilies, I guess. And uh, both can be controlled, but the water lilies, again, though I'd love to have covered with water lilies, it just doesn't seem to happen here in the eight years I've had the pond. They're really fun to do. I enjoy watching the fish, and we have lots of frogs. Uh, peeping out all over in the rocks. You won't see them unless you look for them, but if you have young kids or grandchildren that come, they'll enjoy watching them. For some reason, they're intrigued by the frogs. My greenhouse is full of plants that will be set out in the next couple of weeks. My greenhouse is full of plants that can will be set out in the next few weeks. This little sunshed is where I store my garden things. It is not insulated, so I can't really use it as a greenhouse over the winter, but it certainly is handy in the spring for putting my seedlings and plants that I buy before I'm ready to set them out into the garden. It seems like they get the plants out earlier and earlier every year, and they aren't quite ready to be planted when they get them out. So. I like to store them in here for a little while. I open it during the day and I'll close it up at night, especially these nights that have been getting into the 40s. Next time that we're together, I will be putting together a planter that will stay out here in the shade. Ferns do well and some of the other plants. And so we'll put together a nice planter of annuals that can go in the shade. This is another type of phlox. This is called a woodland phlox. And I have, this is the pink one. It's called home fires, not home fries, but home fires. And it tends to spread a bit, but I like it. And then uh, after it blooms, it will just become green. The mertensia that we saw two weeks ago has now started to go to seed. Again, I'd like a whole swath of mertensia so I've just let it go to seed, and once it has seeded, I'll cut off the stems, and it will disappear within another month. We have more shade garden over here. This side of the shade garden is as colorful as it's going to be all summer. We have bleeding heart, and we have more woodland phlox. This is a, a blue woodland phlox, it does spread, I love it, I let it spread. Intermixed are wild geraniums and that have just come up. Uh, I let things kind of spread in here. The yellow is golden seal. Uh, it spreads sometimes a little too much. I'm pulling that out quite a bit. And then I have interspersed hosta and a few other plants and ferns, of course. And many of the ferns just appeared. Uh, because this is a woodland, a natural woodland. So I call it kind of an edited woodland because I have added things, but I've also let things grow that just grew here naturally. The wild geraniums particularly are going to be coming into bloom all over in the next few weeks. And again, I didn't plant those. 
nor did I plant some of the other things. They, it just came and I let it be. We also have more of the bluebells out here, adding to the color. And we'll have some iris a little later on. This is a little sunnier section. Some perennial geraniums in here uh, that are now in bloom. And this is uh, leopard's bane, which is just coming out of bloom. The yellow at this end is leopard's bane, or geronicum is its real name. And more, uh, some iris that will be blooming. And of course, the bleeding heart. And we still have blooms on pulmonaria. Again, the pulmonaria will be nice foliage later. Once it's bloomed, I'll cut it back. And here's another columbine. This is a, a wild version. I, I did plant it, but it is reminiscent of the wild types that would grow in this area. As I said, this is the most colorful that this garden will be all season. Most of the time it's pretty gentle greens and different shades and different shapes. A rather calming garden. A few more things will bloom. This is the big show for this garden. Now let's see what we can do with some of the things we can pick in the garden. Okay, we're back on the patio and in the shade a little bit. One of the things that's in bloom in the garden that I did not plant would be violets. And I've picked a few of the violets and we're going to candy them. And these make great garnishes on baked goods. They're kind of novel. They're not hard to do. I'm going to paint them with egg white. Now, instead of real egg white, I use dried egg white, which is safer if you're going to eat them. And they are edible. Violets are edible, as are pansies. Pansies and violas often are used as a garnish in salads. And the violets, when sugared, make a very nice then we're going to use some very fine sugar. This is super fine sugar. Uh, and we're going to coat both sides of that violet with the egg mixture. The dried egg whites you just uh, reconstitute with water. You can use real ones. They aren't real safe because of the salmonella that's sometimes in them. I prefer to use a dried egg or pasteurized egg product if, if you're not going to cook something. And we definitely don't cook these. so. We'll just kind of bury it in the sugar till all the edges are coated. And then spread it out on wax paper. I've left the stems long. It's easier to, to work with them. Pick another good one here. The violets are almost gone, so unless you have some in the shade, it may be too late for this year. I try to make a few of these each year. I'll do the same thing with rose petals a little later on. I keep them in a little tin box, and once they've dried, which will take a few days, I'll just put them in a dark, oh, I didn't get any there, a, a dark, dry place for a few days on the wax paper, face down, and let them dry. And when they're fully dry, you, you can kind of tell, they'll get brittle. And then I layer them with wax paper in a little metal box, and I keep them in my freezer. And they'll last for several years that way. If you don't keep them in the freezer, I'm not sure how long they last, but once they're frozen, you keep them very uh, dry in the freezer and airtight, or at least the box is airtight or watertight, and they'll last for quite a long time. You can. Uh, just use an individual petal on a small dessert, and it really is quite pretty, especially on chocolate. If you frost a cupcake with chocolate and put this in the middle, little piece of it, it really looks nice. The other thing you can do with violets is to just grind it in the food processor or blender with sugar. Now, if you do that, you don't want to use the green part of the violet. The center of the violet has a little green and yellow in it. You just want the colored part. And you can grind about a half a cup of those with an equal amount of sugar. And again, let that dry, and you'll have a lovely lavender sugar. 
and you didn't use any artificial colors to make it. You can also candy the uh, violas. I don't think they are quite as effective. They're larger and uh, they don't seem to hold up as well in the freezer, but you can certainly do it. The next thing that I made was with rhubarb and there are so many recipes for rhubarb. There's rhubarb jam, there's rhubarb pie, strawberry rhubarb pie, all kinds of rhubarb things. This happens to be a rhubarb custard square and uh, it's a crust and then it's filled with rhubarb, about a quarter rhubarb, sprinkled with sugar, flour and cinnamon and then an egg and milk mixture with vanilla in it is poured on top and the whole thing is baked. This is kept in the refrigerator, of course, because of the custard, but it makes a really nice spring dessert. And it's a lot like rhubarb pie, only it might serve a few more people. You can make jam with rhubarb. Rhubarb also freezes extremely well. This is a stalk I've cut. Just cut it in pieces with a knife, uh, after you've washed it, of course, and uh, pack it in plastic bags or freezer boxes and it'll freeze beautifully. You don't have to process it, you don't have to do anything, but if you like rhubarb, it makes a great uh, thing to have in your freezer to use in the winter. You can also use it in muffins. Uh, it's tart flavor. It's a little bit cherry-like. It's very tart. Uh, you have to have a taste for it, but once you have a taste for it, you look forward to it every spring. At least I do. The next thing I'm going to make is my version of May wine. Now normally May wine would call for a nice Riesling and some uh, Sect, which is a German sparkling wine, or Champagne. I'm going to make a non-alcoholic version as just a refreshing drink. And I've picked the sweet Woodruff. Remember that lovely little flower? May wine was a traditional May Day drink in Germany for May Day celebrations when they would dance around the Maypole and drink May wine. Maybe that's why they danced around the Maypole, because they drank the May wine. But uh, evidently their woodruff came up and bloomed a little earlier than ours does. At any rate, I thought for May we ought to have some May wine. So what I've done is put about a half a cup of woodruff, which I kind of bruised by just kind of wine winding it together and squeezing it, and I've put that into some white grape juice. And what I'm going to do is just strain it into the carafe. Eventually I'll strain the rest in. We're going to add a couple strawberries. Uh, this is a traditional thing to serve May wine with some strawberries in it. Unfortunately, ours aren't quite ready. They're starting to form fruit, but they aren't quite ready yet. So I'll add some of this, and you would do the same thing. This would be your Riesling if you were using wine. And you can also use the woodruff dried. You can dry it, and many of the recipes do call for dried woodruff the same way, but you would still strain it out as you served it. And then I add some seltzer or club soda. And garnish it with a little woodruff flour. And there's our, our version of May wine. That concludes today's episode, and I hope you'll join me next time for a walk in the garden when we'll look at some of the things to do in June and see what's blooming and what we can harvest. This is Liz Davy, and I'm on NCTV with a walk in the garden. Mm -hmm.